And this is interesting um, because really what it's showing here is the idea that sometimes the more success you have, sometimes these feelings can even be stronger, uh, which is sort of ironic. Um, so, um, and the idea is that the more success you have, the more that you worry that you're one mistake away from losing everything. Um, so that's another way of thinking about this concept. So for those who've joined for the first time, what happens is I usually um, share some of the research on this topic, and then we go to our laureates for some, some tips. Um, the history of this um, concept, it comes from these um, um, social psychology researchers, uh, Clance and Imes, who carried out a study in 1978 of high achieving women. And what they sort of discovered at that time was that despite the fact that these women were really high achieving, they had these sorts of feelings, like feeling like a fraud, um, being able to unable to internalize success. And what that means is um, when when sometimes when people achieve things, they don't um, recognize that that's actually, you know, partly down to them. And instead they see it as, oh, it was just luck or it was I was just charming or I don't know, the competition wasn't very good. But that, but this sort of um, not owning the success can be part of this phenomenon, um, and and related to that feeling when people praise you or give feedback, feeling like no 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 I don't I'm not worthy of that praise, um, even though you've been successful in the past and taught great classes or whatever it is, or networked successfully, this sort of part of this phenomenon is still still going into those situations again and feeling that you can't um, replicate that success. Um, part of it is about overestimating the abilities of others um, and, and underestimating actually how much effort they have put in um, to be successful. One of the things, one of the questions that people asked um, is um, how do we differentiate imposter syndrome from genuine limitations in our capabilities. Um, and um, the, I think the way to differentiate this, this um, imposter phenomenon is that it, it usually applies to people who are actually very successful, actually, you know, and, and are regarded as successful, but nevertheless, they still feel um, that they're not quite um, up to scratch. So um, that is part of this um, particular uh, um, phenomenon. So what happens if people experience imposter syndrome? Well, um, obviously anxiety can be part of the consequences. Self-monitoring, which means you become very focused on, you know, seeing how what it is that you're feeling and um, very conscious of, of your anxiety and so on. Impression management, meaning that you become very focused on trying to look good and manage your impression. Um, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, except it, it sort of just all adds to the burden of, of you know, trying to do what you're doing. Um, but perhaps one of the most negative consequences of this um, feeling is um, that it can lead to avoidance. So um, where you, you might sort of turn down opportunities. So you might be invited to do a public talk or you might um, get an opportunity to network, but you turn it down because you feel like, um, you know, feel like you're not confident in that situation and you won't be successful. Um, and or another form of that is when you try to, you know, lower other people's expectations. But these forms of avoidance, as I'll talk about a bit later, are perhaps um, some of the more damaging consequences of of um, imposter feelings because they really can create a little bit of a um, self-perpetuating cycle where you don't feel confident, so you withdraw and you don't do things and then you don't get that opportunity to correct your feelings of confidence and it can become a little bit of a vicious circle. Another consequence though can be pressure. Um, so because you feel um, like you're you know, not up to scratch, um, you one sometimes people react to that not so much by avoiding, but by doubling down. You know, by doing much more work, by working much longer days, by never saying no, 
um, by really pushing yourself, over preparing, um, those sorts of things. And, and that obviously can have implications then for things like stress and burnout. Um, and then ultimately, I guess the consequence is um, reduced joy uh, um, in your work. So, um, and here's an example of a, a comment actually that came from one of you guys. I always feel like I don't know enough and therefore should not write about something unless I've read every source on the issue, which is usually impossible. It makes me feel like I'm not good enough. So that's an example of how this um, can, can play out. So um, I just share with you this um, imposter cycle, which I found quite useful. Um, so the idea here is that you, you have a project or a piece of work, or it might be, uh, let's, let's just imagine it's being invited to do some public speaking. Um, and then that causes um, a sense of anxiety, self-doubt, am I good enough? You know, I'm not really good enough, etc. And then, as I mentioned, the consequence could be that either you avoid it, which is the procrastination. So you're just like, you're so worried about it, you just don't do it and you put it off and so on. Or maybe you go the other way and you over prepare and you start your presentation like, you know, three weeks before and really waste too much time because you're anxious. Um, then, of course, you do it and you do really well um, um, and you feel relieved and you get positive feedback. But maybe when you get that positive feedback, you focus more on, oh, I was just lucky or I just put in a lot of effort and you don't actually internalize access, that success, which I mentioned before. So you discount or ignore or push away that positive feedback. And then the consequence of that is that, again, you feel like, you know, really, I just faked it. You know, I wasn't really that, uh, you know, capable. Um, I just was lucky. I just faked it. And you, you discount some of the positive feedback. And then, of course, you get another piece of work and the cycle begins again. So I think that's um, a helpful um, um, thing to think about. And I'll talk a little bit later about how you might intervene in that cycle um, to change um, um, this, to, to break it, I guess. And that's what we would want to do. When does the imposter um, feelings, when do imposter feelings arise? Well, the first thing is most people feel these feelings at least occasionally, okay? Um, and you saw some quotes from some very famous people um, feeling that, re, um, feeling those things. It applies to men and women, the research shows. There is some evidence that women are perhaps more likely to feel, um, to feel imposter syndrome, but there are certainly circumstances where men feel it as well. Um, it tends to be higher based on the research when you are in new roles and new challenges, makes sense. Actually, some anxiety there is completely normal and natural. Um, people who are the first in the family to, to go on and get educated and do things like that um, often feel the, the weight of that on their shoulders. Um, if you're a female in a very male environment, if you're a male in a very female environment, um, those both would be situations where imposter feelings are more likely. If you're in a really hyper competitive environment, so if you're in a culture that is um, hyper competitive, you're more likely to feel this. And if you are min a, a minority, um, be that on the basis of gender we've talked about, but also race or age or um, sexuality or any other um, um, aspect. Um, and two interesting um, an interesting paper there just for anyone um, who, who wants to pursue this a bit further. I just found this paper. It's it's just a bit more of a, it's called an auto ethnographic account, but it's really quite a personal story of someone um, suffering really from um, this, these sorts of feelings. And, and she talks about um, how that sort of caused her to be you know, excessive in her teaching preparation because she was so feeling so fraudulent about that. It is really important to, to note that um, that imposter feelings are much more likely and much greater when there is bias and exclusion in the environment. Um, and, and in fact, um, some scholars um, are critical of this imposter syndrome because they see it as blaming women for what are normal reactions to bias and discrimination. And you can see I've just put the Harvard Business Review article, which made this case um, there that you can follow up. Um, so that came out in February this year. 
And what they really argue is um, that sometimes the notion of imposter syndrome, syndrome is sort of used to um, almost perpetuate bias because it's used to sort of make it seem as though it's um, women's fault um, for having these um, feelings. So um, and what my view on that, by the way, is, is that it's, it's, um, it's really helpful to recognise that bias, exclusion, discrimination, harassment, all these um, um, systemic and cultural factors absolutely play a role here. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that we can't also focus on what we ourselves as individuals do. And just because we focus on what we as individuals do, it doesn't mean we're blaming the individuals. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to share with you actually some research that I did a, a million years ago. <clears throat> this was some research that I did with the, the police um, in the UK. Um, and this was at the time where um, women were uh, very much being um, negatively treated. There was a huge amount of sexual harassment of, of women in the police at that time, and our research was all about that. And one of the things um, that we focused on in our research was um, this idea of overperformance demands, and it's actually sort of similar to imposter feelings. And this is this idea, and, and I'm sure some of you recognise this in yourself, but this feeling that you have to sort of overperform so constantly prove yourself and never say no and do twice as well as your colleagues and so on in order to get recognition and acceptance at work. So that's what we measured. And what we found was that um, unsurprisingly for female police officers, this feeling of overperformance demands was much higher. And interestingly, as um, female police officers went up the rank, so they became sergeant or superintendent, or actually the feeling of pressure over performance demand got even higher. But interestingly for male police officers, these feelings were lower in the first place and the higher they went in the rank, the lower their level of um, over performance demand. So almost like they felt like they were doing, they were succeeding and so the, the pressure was off a little bit. Whereas for women, uh, in the police in those days, the more that you went up in rank, the more visible you were, the more that you were managing men who perhaps didn't want you there, um, and the more that you felt this pressure to be like superwoman. Um, and But the interesting thing, and the reason I'm sharing this little piece of research with you, is that what we found is that, well, first of all, you can see from this model here that if you experience this sense of overperformance demand, you do tend to experience more distress um, and, you know, that's related to burnout and all those sorts of things. Um, but what's interesting here and these figures that I've put in a circle, these are the these are the beta weights from the model um, of women and the weights underneath it are for men. And what you can see is that for women, if you experience gender harassment, and gender harassment is sort of what they call low level harassment. Uh, so it's not um, overt sexual harassment, but it's much more just like, well, the, the, the example I keep thinking of in the police was, you know, um, put the kettle on, you know, people, the women would be told to, you know, make the tea and stuff. So it's, it's harassment, um, but it's more of that sort of insidious um, low level um, harassment. What you can see is that the women who experienced that were much more likely to feel this sense of, I've got to overperform, and it makes complete sense, right? Because if you're being undermined in the workplace through gender harassment, then you're much more likely to feel this sort of sense that I've got to prove myself and I've got to be super good at my job and so on. Um, and you can also see that if people felt that women were not accepted in the police, much stronger in, um, impact on overperformance demand. And also, if you were someone who was struggling to, to juggle family and work, also feeling more of this overperformance demand. And what's interesting is that those, we examine those same, same relationships for men, but for men, first of all, they don't experience much gender harassment in the police, um, but some did. Um, and but they didn't really have any impact. Um, you can see the beta weight there is non-significant on it didn't have much impact on on them um, and and same for the, the other factors. So I just share that research with you to be clear 
that um, absolutely the situation that you're in can shape these sorts of feelings um, that can make you feel more like an imposter. So what do we do about it? And I just uh, will um, cover that fairly um, briefly. And I quite like this little cartoon here. This is Dr. Adams. She's a social psychologist and the world's top expert on imposter syndrome. Ha ha, don't be silly. There are lots of scholars who've made more significant. And then she realizes, oh my God, what is she doing? <laughs> so how do we address um, imposter feelings? Well, obviously, given what I've just said about the role of workplaces, in, um, in fostering these feelings or creating a culture where these feelings are more likely. Um, you know, we need to be looking at reducing bias, discrimination, harassment and exclusion and building more diversity. We also need to have those fair systems for performance assessment and promotion. And in the past, in these sessions, I've talked about how women's performance, the exact same performance can actually sometimes be rated more negatively than men's performance. And actually there's some research that just came out and you might've heard about it. Um, actually there's been research on this for years, but some recent research came out showing that women's, um, women, female teachers teaching academics, um, their performance is um, rated lower than male um, academics. And there've been some very cool experiments that show that uh, very compellingly. So you teach an online class where the material is all mapped out and all you do is you change whether it's a male or a female teaching it, um, literally just the name because it's all online and you see lower performance ratings for women. So some fairly strong evidence that women's performance is often judged differently. And we've talked about that in other sessions. So of course, if we um, have those unfair assessments or um, different standards being applied for women, that's going to make them more anxious about their performance and, and experience this imposter syndrome. So what can you as an individual do? Well, obviously you can help build these diverse, unbiased workplaces. Um, but more personally, I think one thing is just recognising that these feelings um, are a quite normal response. Um, they're a normal response um, to being in a challenging situation, but they're also particularly um, strong, as I've mentioned, when you're in a culture where, you know, there have been stereotypes about women's performance or bias and so on. I think probably the most important thing is to really think about how you respond and increase your self-awareness. Um, and if you do that, then you can start to develop new ways of talking to yourself or new scripts. Um, so, and, and, and the, the final one there is um, about seeking out mentoring, support and connection. That's part of what this series is about. Um, but if, if we look at this idea of new scripts and just go back to the cycle that I mentioned, what I'm suggesting almost is you try to break the cycle. And there's multiple points that you could try to break the cycle. So one could be, for example, if you're having these feelings, you know, you might um, be able to change the way you think about things um, through um, either mindfulness sorts of techniques or through more trying to reframe um, things. You might even just accept those feelings actually is, is, also, um, is also a strategy. The issue is perhaps not the feelings. The issue is what do you do? And if, if the feelings are causing you to spend three weeks preparing one lecture, which is just going to kill you because we all have too much to do, you know, then you might have to do some tricky little things to yourself, like say, OK, I'm not actually going to start preparing until the day before. So at most you can only prepare for a day or whatever. You might have different strategy, but you could break the cycle there. If you're someone who avoids and procrastinates or puts off or turns opportunities down because of imposter syndrome, then be aware of that and um, and um, consciously try to make some different decisions. Actually, the research shows that that is the one that will hurt you most in the long run if you become avoidant, um, because in fact, um, it's jumping in and getting doing things, as you've heard many times from women laureates, um, that, that ultimately tends to lead to success. Um, another point of intervention, of course, if you do it and you do well and you get that good feedback, try to own that good feedback and be aware that you're pushing it away or you're discounting it or you're saying, oh, I was just lucky. So be self-conscious and, and try to accept and own your success. And then 
finally recognising um, next time you're about to do another piece of work that's similar, you know, recognising this cycle and seeing if you can you can break the cycle there. So that is some um, a little bit of the research evidence, a little bit of the thinking and some of my um, suggestions. Um, and um, I mean, I guess I guess really what I'm saying here is, you know, understanding that the environment that you're in, the supervisor you've got, the manager you've got, the colleagues you've got, uh, the pressure that we have as academics, all these things are perfect fuel for fostering um, these feelings. Um, and, you know, let's work also on changing those systems and cultures and unrealistic performance expectations. But also let's work on how we ourselves respond to that and look at how we might break that cycle. So um, guys, I'm now very, very excited to introduce our two ARC um, laureate fellows um, that are going to share with you some of their tips um, on this topic. So first you'll hear from uh, Professor Karen Anstey, who is one of Australia's top dementia scientists. Uh, she's a sci Scientia professor at the University of New South Wales, and she leads the UNSW um, Aging Futures Institute and all sorts of amazing things. You can read the long list of things um, that, that Karen uh, uh, does. So Karen, I believe, is a cognitive psychologist. Karen, you can correct me in a minute if I'm wrong. I think that's your disciplinary background. Um, and then we will hear from uh, Professor uh, Naomi McClure-Griffiths, who is an ARC Laureate Fellow, and she is an astronomist or astrophysicist um, and uh, from the Australian National University and works on these amazing topics like the evolution of the Milky Way. Um, so what's great about our two laureates today is we have quite different disciplinary perspectives. Um, and um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to, I'm going to stop sharing and we are going to now um, hear from Karen. So welcome, Karen, and uh, thank you very much. You will have to unmute yourself, of course. Thank you, Sharon, and um, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to this session today. Um, this is just some kind of um, thoughts that I've put together on the topic. I'm, this is not my area of expertise, um, but I think it, this imposter syndrome is um, something that is is sort of accentuated by the academic career path and a couple of some of the features of it, which I wanted to discuss. This is just my own personal reflections. It's not evident, necessarily evidence based. Um, so I think um, what I'm seeing, also what I'm seeing a lot on the chat is how people are feeling, feeling like an imposter. And I think this is one of the issues is uh, the difference between how you feel about your achievements and, and what's coming up and the actual facts about how you're achieving. And it's, it's that difference between the two where we have this problem. Um, and the way to overcome it is to develop a realistic assessment of yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, and how you rank um, in your peer group. And that becomes easier over time, the longer you are in the academic career, because you get more feedback as you go. And when you first join academia as a postdoc, you're usually one of a very small group who've been lucky enough or talented enough, should I say, to um, win a, a fellowship or a position. Um, so you're not, you're sort of new, you're not, um, you're into a new peer group and then you have to learn to judge your ability um, within that. But there's a number of things that make that particularly difficult. And one is the fact that in academia, um, unlike most professions, the norm is rejection and failure. So most grants are not successful. Most the majority of papers get rejected. Um, we are honed, our critical skills are honed from day one. We learn to write grant, you know, grant reviews, journal reviews to find the flaws in, in our own work and others' work, the methodological issues, the conceptual issues, and we're actually praised for being good at criticism. So we're in a whole culture of negativity and criticism. And then so it's, that, that's why I think it's difficult to then balance that with a realistic positive 
um, sense of self. So that's part of the just just our profession compared to another profession, say a clinical profession where most people you help and at the end of the session they thank you and you've done something really constructive and positive and you get an instant reward. We may not get that paper or grant. We might have to submit it multiple times over several years before we get the reward. So that's part of the issue that we have. Um, it's also highly competitive compared to a number of other professions. We're always competing. Um, it's not like you get qualified and then you go and go to work every day and you do your job. You're constantly having to put pit yourself and your CV and your ideas against others. So, so you're always in that. Um, you're always feeling vulnerable. You never feel that you've made it, and that just continues. Although you get used to, so those feelings, I think you learn to tolerate, and you be, they become familiar feelings. The grant rounds become familiar. You know, you sort of get get you position yourself for when the when the results come out so that you, you learn strategies of normalising all of that. Um, the other difference in academia, I think, is that often what we're working on takes years. So we're not getting that short term feedback. We might be working on a paper or a project and we're not getting any feedback. So we might or a creative work. So if you're in the arts, for example, your idea might have taken years to develop and then you submit it. So you might have three or four years before you get any feedback. And I think that's particularly difficult and self doubt can really grow through that period of time. So I think all of these things make us very prone in our discipline or in our profession to, to sort of um, self doubt and imposter syndrome. And then as Sharon's really pointed out, and I'm sure that many, you, you know, we're all aware this compounds with other forms of implicit bias. So if you're from a minority group where there's there's been bias against you and there's low expectations of your achievements, this I think compounds with these other feelings in academia, so that you're sort of got you've got to deal with both, and you've got to deal with other people's expectations as well as your own. And I mean that we see that with women, and so we know in academia we have the, the leaky pipeline with women dropping out, particularly in that postdoctoral period, and that's for all of these reasons often coming together um, at that time. So this does have a real impact on us and, uh, and, and on academia with losing really good people who, who, I'm not saying this is the only reason, but it's part of that, that sort of cocktail of reasons that I think uh, leads to women in particular, and not just women, but women in particular dropping out um, at those lower levels. Um, I just I had some other points on my notes, so I think um, some there are some vulnerable points that I've noticed and one is particularly when and having children that transition around trying to manage an academic career and children at the same time. Um, it's it's easier to to um, I think not be taken as seriously and not take it and your your loyalties are divided your concentrations divided. I think that's a very vulnerable time for things like imposter syndrome people losing their self confidence. So I think again mentoring and, and women supporting each other through that period is extremely important. Um, and the other thing I'd just like to end on is a, is a bit of an anecdote of mine. Um, I was um, asked to be a mentor at an international conference for early career. It, the session was called Lunch with the Stars. So we went and, and, you know, I was one of the stars, as were a number of people, and we were meant to have lunch with this cohort of, of up and coming uh, gerontologists. And we had a speaker and the whole session was about how to develop your pitch for networking. And then we were meant to pair up with an early career researcher and they were meant to practice their pitch with us and we would give them feedback. And it was all about, um, you know, how to do this. And, and so they went through all of the different skills and strategies. It was really, really informative. And then, then you got paired up after lunch and you went off. And what I realised was that I'd actually done none of the things that you were supposed to do. I'd, I'd done none of the networking properly. I was really nervous. Um, I'd never, I'd just, I'd never done a pitch properly. Um, and yet, so I sat down and I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, you know, I've ended up with some fantastic colleagues from my networking that I absolutely that are brilliant, great collaborators. I've I've had postdocs approach me and I've got and it still worked because I've really gone on my genuine, you know, I fumbled my way through. I wasn't a great, I've never been good at putting myself out there because I've always suffered from social anxiety and I'm not the, the most brilliant networker and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but I'd still manage. So I think that was the other thing that sometimes you can hear these talks and you think, oh, I've got to do all this and I'm, I'll am i never be able to do it. And actually it, it doesn't matter because one way or another, if you're good at what you do and you have a lot of passion and you do, you do um, continue along, you can get there multiple ways. Some people get there through being 
uh, brilliant at networking or whatever, but it, it's not all like that. Some people are really introverted. Some people are, there's, there's a huge diversity in personality and in personal style, as well as in you know, ethnicity and gender diversity and um, all of the other forms of diversity. So I think that's the other thing is, is being, um, there isn't like a secret recipe about all of this. And I think it is about in the end, self-knowledge and being realistic about who you are and having a good uh, calm assessment of that. So that's all. Sorry, thank you very much, Karen. I'm talking away with my mute on. Um, that was fantastic. And I, I'm really pleased that you sort of reminded us of that academic context and, and how it really compounds so many of the challenges that exist already. Um, but I also love your point at the end that, you know, all these tips that we share, they are tips. And in the end, you have to you have to work out what works for you and it will be different for different people. And I love that mm -hmm. comment. Do we have time for one question, Jess? I think we probably do before we go on to Naomi. Yeah, I think so. I'll give you a, a nice, quick, easy one, Karen. Okay. Um, so someone's written in, how do we lift other women up in the moment when imposter syndrome is striking them? So tools to use in the moment, for example, if you notice, for example, a postdoc student or a PhD student or a postdoc uh, having their, I don't know, imposter syndrome is striking them in the moment in the meeting. What are some tips that um, you found to be useful to uplift them or to sort of um, check them with their imposter syndrome? I think it's just to bring people back to the facts of what they've achieved and the quality of their work um, and to try to focus back on on that and you know they wouldn't be they've got their PhD they've got their you know they're working on that project they wouldn't be there if they didn't have all the correct skills and I think it's just bringing people back to that um, yeah I think that's good advice just a bit of a check-in with the I don't know reality of yeah, I mean, it depends obviously on the on the context and the situation, but and reminding people of their strengths, like pointing out their strengths to them, reminding them of, you you know them better, you know, you have to be someone and you have to know what their strengths are, but clearly you can point, list them out verbally to the person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that can be very affirming. And that the difference between the, the feelings that you can, that mindfulness concept of just watching those feelings drift down the stream those feelings of anxiety and, and inadequacy, just look at those feelings, separate and let them drift away and then focus on the facts in front of you about what you have achieved, what you are working on and the quality of your work. Thanks, Karen. And perhaps reminding people of their past success too, because many of these people are usually good at what they do, <laughs> but Absolutely. they forget in the moment. Yeah, yeah so thank you yeah. so much, Karen. Um, that was terrific and lots of fantastic comments um, in the chat that you can catch up on now. Um, Naomi, I'm absolutely delighted to, to have you join us. So if you could share your tips with us, that would be fantastic. Yeah, okay. Everybody can hear me okay? Yep, great. great. Okay. Um, so I was looking at your cycle of the imposter syndrome and I thought, oh, yep, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. <laughs> so I follow my whole way around this and, and Related to that is when Sharon asked me to to talk today. The first thing I thought was I need to do some research. Um, I don't know anything about imposter syndrome. I mean, I experience it, but I don't know how to fix it. So let me do some research. And I caught myself in the middle of that particular cycle and thought over preparedness. That's me, always an over prepared person. Um, and that's my you know it that's my coping mechanism, but it's not a healthy coping mechanism. But I over prepare for everything. Teaching is a, a chore because I somehow have to spend three weeks on every lecture. Um, but anyway, I, I thought I'd try to give a, a sort of a couple of examples of things that um, have struck me in my career as ways of helping. Um, so one of the big ones um, is early in my career, one of my referees uh, for a job I was applying for sent me a copy of their reference letter. And I read this reference letter and thought, that's not me. <laughs> that's incredible. There's this amazing person that they're describing. And 
then I thought about it a little bit more. I thought, okay, well, yeah, that's kind of truthful. Yep, <laughs> it's reasonable. And every job application that I wrote for the next year or so, I would get out that letter and I would look at that letter before I wrote my job applications so that I would feel a boasted up and confident enough to write a job application or to think about something that I was go aiming for. Um, and throughout then the continuation of my career from then on, I've done things like that. Um, I've held on to pieces of information that are positive feedbacks from teaching. And I look at that before I start a semester of teaching. Um, I go back and read, read the referee's report of a positive grant application before I write into another one. Um, but something that gives me some external uh, feedback that I can then try to internalize for a period of time to get through the thing that I need to get through. Um, and then you may or may not be successful in it, but then at that point, you've got another marker to put up there. So that idea of sort of tracking success um, has been very useful for me. Um, now, saying, saying all these things and saying that I suffer from imposter syndrome, as we all do, I, I also have to say that I have found it e extremely grating when people who seem like they've got it all together say that, oh, yes, I've got imposter syndrome. And you think you do not have imposter syndrome. That's not imposter syndrome. This is imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> and the point is that you don't know what's going on in their head. Right. Um, and you don't know the battles that they are, they're having in their own head, but they've clearly uh, been able to put themselves out there and carry on and do things. And in the same way that, you know, all of you are by showing up here is putting yourself out there to carry on. Um, so I have to try to remind myself that to not be irritated by that. Um, I wanted to uh, let's see, I had two things there. Oh, yes. there. Yeah, yeah. So so at the beginning in the original Slido poll, people were putting down public speaking as a thing that they feel they have a, a lot of imposter syndrome about. And um, this has been one for me that I feel like I've come the furthest with in my career. The, the very first public talk I had to give, I literally spent the night before vomiting. I was so nervous. And now I can stand up and talk in front of 2,000 people and it's fine. Um, and part of what got me there was I never said no to a request to give a talk. And somebody gave me that advice early on um, and I just went with it. And I've now started to say no and I feel guilty when I do, um, but I think it's okay that I've got to a place where it's I can say no on these things. But for a long time, I just forced myself to do it over and over and over and over again. And I found that to be quite a helpful um, thing. Um, and uh, it's also useful for me to recognize that I have imposter syndrome and things that are not related to my academic career, um, because somehow it's, it's slightly less jolting to um, conquer it in those other areas than it is to try to conquer it in my academic career, where I place so much of myself around. So for example, um, I realized this uh, a little while ago that I never like to call myself a runner in spite of the fact that I run four to five days a week. I've run two marathons. I've run, you know, countless half marathons, but I'm not a runner because I'm slow and I'm flawed and I can't, I can't label myself with that. So when I realized that I was doing that, I could take that as a little area I could study, look at how I dealt with it, what techniques I used to, to, sort of accept myself. And it's easier to bring that into my academic career later on by taking something smaller there. Um, and then, then finally, I thought I'd say, um, and not only do I feel like an imposter, but I, you know, I, I literally am all the time an imposter, um, because I am a woman in physics and astrophysics, and there are virtually none of those. And I was the only woman in my um, undergraduate degree doing physics. And so I, I really, really was an imposter. Um, and I sought out the people who made me feel comfortable occasionally. And so to just so that I could back away from that confronting experience. And so I spent a lot of time talking to the administrative assistants um, in the building because there was a place that I could go to that was a safe space. Um, and I did, I felt like I could be me and I didn't have to worry in that place. And that allowed me to get through the other parts of the day where I was feeling so 
out of place um, and so awkward. So those are just some of my um, little things. I, I don't think anybody's got the right answer to how to get around this, um, but coming to recognize what you've got and not letting it stop you seems to be an important part of it. Thank you so much, um, Naomi. I There were many things. I mean, that was a beautiful demonstration, actually, of the imposter cycle there, because you talked about, on the one hand, for some things over-preparing, but you also talked about how the temptation to be avoidant, um, you know, so the temptation to say no to public speaking, because that's where you feel, you know, at risk. But in fact, the, 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 the fact that you had a strategy for not letting yourself avoid, and I think that's what is very, very important here. Um, you say you said that you say no now for talks, but you're doing it for a different reason, right? You're not doing it because you're worried about, you know, how you'll be perceived and all those things. You're doing it because you're overloaded and I'm sure you get asked to do far too many. So thank you for coming today <laughs> on that basis. But um, and that's and that's fine. But it's when you it's when your imposter feelings lead you to withdraw that it's probably most damaging for our careers. And that's what research would suggest, I think, as well as our own experiences. So thank you so much for sharing. And Jess, do you have a nice, easy question for Naomi? <laughs> yes. <laughs> or a hard one, or a hard question. <laughs> well, I've saved the more like practical ones when we go to everyone as a group, but I thought um, this one might be good for you, Naomi, considering um, your experience being a woman in physics uh, and in academia. So uh, someone's written in, women feel imposter syndrome in many settings, but is there something particularly about the academic setting in which women encounter it more acutely? If so, why do you think that is? Hmm, well, um, that's a very good question. That's not an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a thought provoking question. Yeah, so I, I do think that we've hit a, in a number of different places. One is being, you know, being the unusual person out. Another one is that um, our, the nature of the academic setting is a very, um, it's an argumentative um, setting, right? You, you're, you're constantly uh, critiquing ideas and in having to defend them as, as Karen talked about very nicely there. Um, and that's the whole way is that you, you put forward something, you shoot it down, you put it down, you shoot it down. Um, and that is, for a lot of women, that confrontational aspect is not comfortable anyway. That's, that's already a problematic situation to be in. Um, and then trying to pick that up and, and work with it can make it even more difficult. But I don't know that I've got a good answer, really. Can I just jump in there? One thing I would say, Jess, is that um, I think that Karen and Naomi have highlighted, yeah, the competitive nature, um, all those things are downsides. But there is a positive to the academic world, and that is that um, research performance can be quite objectively um, quantified because you, you could, could, because you can look at papers that people have published. Now, that's not to say there's not bias going into getting those papers, right, being invited to be part of work and so on. But if you can actually deliver good quality work, and this goes back to Karen's point, it's objectively there. It's it's a, it's a So that, that I've personally found good in my career because whereas it could be easily, you know, like, oh, you know, you, you could be easily dismissed and, and so on, but people can't absorb, ignore the objective evidence in front of them that you've published X number of top tier papers or whatever. So there is also an upside, I think, to academia mm -hmm. um, that, that can help a little bit too. And that goes back to Karen's point about trying to remember your objective success or your actual success. Very true. Thank you, Sharon. Um, shall we do some questions for all yes, three? That yeah. would be great. Um, there's been a lot of discussion also uh, in the chat just about a few of the points that Karen and Naomi both raised about the, the criticism or the critiquing feedback kind of culture of academia and how, um, you know, postdocs or PhD students aren't necessarily trained to do that, uh, to give feedback or to receive that feedback. So that can be quite a steep learning curve when you first sort of, you know, enter into academia. Um, and it's not something we're trained in. We're trained to do research and then we then have to learn this whole 
other area of reviewing feedback, criticism, etc. Um, so a question I thought uh, we could start with was, uh, you know, someone's written in as an early career researcher applying for grants and fellowships. I'm constantly having to benchmark myself on applications. Any tips to prevent imposter syndrome creeping in when I'm constantly comparing myself to others whilst trying to sell myself? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> well, this is where yeah, I think you can rely on, on Sharon's point about the, um, the objective measures that can be very helpful there, where you can, you can make a plot you know, if you like, or a, a histogram of your number of your papers or the, you know, whatever it may be, number of talks that you've given or something that's a kind of objective thing. I mean, and you find the one because there's, it's going to be, there's going to be 40 different types of plots and you're going to look good in two of them. Uh, you find the one or two where you do look good um, and you use that as a way of helping remind yourself, but then putting it out there for your reviewers. Karen, do you have any thoughts on that one? I I think it's, it, it's well, just similar, just to focus on what you have achieved and, and communicating that clearly, and also um, the, the quality of your ideas of what you're working on, believing in what you're doing and being able to express the novelty of that and the passion that you have for that work. Mm. I think it's it is a real difficult one for all of us all the way through our careers. It's very you get intimidated by the weight of it all. Um, if you start looking around, you actually have to focus on the task and just get in and write that grant. I think. Yeah, and you have to be prepared to write it again because you know yes. probably rea in the reality you won't get it the first yeah. time or even the second time. And this is one of the hard things, but just yeah. keeping on going. But, you know, changing you, you might need to change a strategy or invite someone more senior onto the grant or whatever, um, you know, yeah. continuing in a, in a persistent way, but not perhaps shifting your strategy can sometimes not be not be productive, but you do yeah. need to keep on going too. Thanks, Jess. Another question? Yeah, um, I think this one's a good one because we know we, know we normally get a lot of uh, early career researchers in attendance to the webinars. So um, for the three of you, uh, as a more senior academic, how can I help my junior female colleagues to overcome imposter syndrome? So this might be, for example, uh, in collaboration relationships or in supervisory relationships, or if you are, at, you know, an academic and you have a postdoc, for example. You go, Karen. Yeah, I mean, this this is. This is quite a long one. It take this is a whole session. We could have a whole session on this for mentors in, in a way. But I think um, promoting your your postdocs, so giving them opportunities, setting up networks for them, nominating them for awards, including them on your grants, giving them genuine opportunities to collaborate on on papers and projects, linking them, helping. Um, facilitating them in, to get um, opportunities to supervise students so i think there is an active role in in um enhance you know enhancing the careers of the people that you mentor i think those 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 are sort of some of the just things that come to mind initially thanks karen and i was probably going to say something similar in some senses it's about trying to help them be successful right yeah <laughs> because yeah. um because in a sense it's that objective success that we're saying you know you can then use to calibrate against these yeah. feelings. Yeah. Um, and we did do a webinar on um, mentoring and sponsorship. And in a sense, some of those things you talked about, Karen, there are sort of forms of sponsorship. So not just yeah. guiding and helping people, but, you know, putting people's names forward or recommending them for prizes or whatever. Um, yeah. Bit more active types of support. Um, so that's a great comment. Naomi, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah. I fully agree with you know the the various forms of mentoring and particularly the one where you um you put somebody forward sort of something that's a stretch for them um so you know you would be really good to lead this project even though they almost certainly wouldn't have thought of it because it's quite a big jump but you can see that they could make that jump that belief so having somebody else's belief in you can really make a big um difference um and then of course on the on the flip the other side there's just the some people really need pep talks 
you know, they really need you to talk them up and get them to sort of bolster their own confidence at the right moment. And watching out for when that moment is, um, is something that I spent, or I try to spend a lot of time doing. Thank you, Naomi. Jess, I think we've got time for one more, and yep. then I will, I will wrap up. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, I actually was gonna go back to the Slido, uh, just oh, yes. looking at some of the, well, we can show it again, if you yeah. like it. And, um, be but great. there's been quite a few people who have responded to the Slido question, you know, in what situations do you feel most like an imposter? And the answer was when someone calls me an expert. And I think that was quite funny because I think we can all relate to that if we are, you know, um, doing research in an area and someone uh, contacts you for an interview or, a, you know, to do a talk or something and they refer to you as an expert in the area and it's a bit confronting. <laughs> um, so I was wondering about, you know, your the three of you, your reflections on, yeah, the first few times that someone started referring to you as an expert in the area and, you know, how do you feel now when someone refers to you as an expert? Oh, that's a tough one, Jess. Um, <laughs> we're, look, getting I, deep. we're getting deep yeah, today. I can't, I can't remember when it changed, but I am now quite comfortable with being called a work design expert. <laughs> but honestly, it, it, I've been doing it for 30 years, so <laughs> one would hope I feel comfortable. Um, but yeah, look, I, I, I and even now, I, I find myself, industry might say, oh, you know, Sharon's an expert in, I don't let's just say um, women's leadership development, right? I'll be like, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. I haven't done research on that, which is actually sort of ridiculous. So I think I still probably struggle with being, I, I own some, the, well, the ones I've worked on for 30 years, but others perhaps less so. <laughs> but what, do, what about you, Naomi and Karen? Yeah, I think it, it's very much a, a sense of the, um, the radius of your expertise, you becoming more and more comfortable with a growing radius of that. But there's always something that sits around the boundaries that you don't feel comfortable with. So, you know, at the end of your PhD, you do start, you feel like an expert on the one thing that you did your PhD on, and then it gradually gets bigger and bigger. So if somebody called me an expert on astronomy, I would be, that would, no, I'm not, but I'm an expert on my bit of astronomy, you know, and that's where things, but when you're interacting with people um, not outside of academia, the those things get blurred a lot more. So media contact will, you know, contact you, you're an expert on space. And I'm, you know, I'll be asked to co comment on recently, it was on the, um, the CO in output of a rocket being launched into space. And I was like, I have no idea, but you know what? I can probably figure it out and it'll be good enough for them. Yeah. Um, and when you realize that you can wing it, it really helps your confidence. Karen? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think it, it depends on the context entirely. So an expert at an academic conference in your own area, <laughs> the bar's a lot higher. Um, but with the media, um, you know, you you are often an expert in a broad area and you'd rather have someone who's got a proper scientific evidence base talking to the media than than not. So I think your you know, definition of expert is, is really dependent on the context. Um, and you do become more confident um, in being seen as an expert and you expand your scope or domain of expertise as you go on. Yeah, that's very true. I also, um, there was someone, I can't remember who it was in the chat earlier, um, made the distinction or uh, said that they liked the distinction between being an expert or the expert. Yeah. Um, and I quite yeah. like that. <laughs> I really yeah. like that. Like, I, I'm okay to say that I'm an expert in XYZ, but not the expert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, guys. Um, we've just got one more minute. Um, so, I will wrap up. Um, first of all, I would like to um, say that we have a fantastic webinar coming up next time. We are actually going to have our first male presenter, and that's um, ARC Laureate Fellow Alex Haslam, who has done some absolutely amazing research on the glass cliff phenomenon for women, which is when women go into leadership roles that are more precarious, lots of famous examples in history. Um, so I really encourage you to sign up for that one. It will be fantastic. Um, I do just want to remind you the point of this um, series is about small wins and this idea of just trying to take one small little tip or idea 
um, just one and try it um, before the end of the week. And do feel free to share in the chat or um, on um, our Facebook website anything that you've tried last time or plan to try this time um, in the spirit of sharing that we're all on this journey to, to develop. And last but absolutely not least, I would like to thank um, the Australian Research Council and Curtin University for supporting this project. Most importantly to Karen and Naomi for their fantastic insights. I think um, there have been such positive feedback coming through on the chat. Um, so thank you so much, guys, um, for your generous um, contribution of time today. Um, and thank you to all the people who've been involved in this series behind the scenes um, and, and Carol and Sana, uh, Isabel, and of course, Jess, for your wonderful question asking. So um, that's pretty much it from us. Maybe Jess, you could flick up that Slido sh um, uh, screen. I will, I will stop. I don't think I need to stop sharing and people can see that. But thank you all so much and I hope you have a wonderful rest of day and thank you for joining us. We couldn't do it without you <laughs> and uh, really appreciate your engagement um, and energy and interest. Thank you. Thank you. And there you can see the Slido. Uh, so networking, public speaking are the number one <laughs> areas. Uh, so that's great. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, Karen and Naomi, again, very much appreciate your input. And I will send you a separate email. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, all right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. See you later.